Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship today on this beautiful, very warm spring morning. I invite you to join me in our call to worship, which is on the screen. Sing praises to the Lord, you faithful. We will give thanks to God's holy name. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. We will give thanks to God's holy name. God has turned our mourning into dancing. Let us praise and not be silent. Lord our God, we give thanks to your holy name now and always. Our opening hymn this morning is Thine Be the Glory, number 258 in your hymn books. be seated. Please join me in prayer. Generous and loving God, with open hearts, minds, and spirits, we gather to praise you, grateful that your arms are thrown so wide in welcome. We come to you as we are, peaceful and worried, busy and not busy enough, with pain and with joy, with grief and with hope, full of faith and full of fear. Thank you for loving us as we are. We are even more grateful that you never leave us as we are. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we see beyond all doubt that nothing exists beyond your saving power. You work within our brokenness, our limitations and our losses to bring new life. You have overcome even death, promising us and all creation the power of your transforming love and the gift of new beginnings. God, our Redeemer, in raising Jesus from the dead, 
You showed us your power to defeat all that brings fear and sorrow into our lives. Yet when things go wrong, we confess we are sometimes uncertain how to find Jesus. We are unsure if we can trust the promise of the resurrection. Forgive us when we struggle with doubt about your presence with us. Forgive us when we doubt our own worthiness of the love you've poured out in creation through your Son. And forgive us when we use those doubts as an excuse to be unkind or hurtful towards others. Merciful God, we have sinned against you and against one another, and what we have thought and what we have said and done and failed to do, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and by the power of your Spirit, grant that we may serve you in newness of life. Lord, it is by Easter's light that we worship this day. In that light, we dare to believe, to trust, to risk, and to pray in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Help us this hour to look and to listen for your words and your wisdom in this place. Breathe life into our singing, our praying, our speaking, our listening, and our going, that in Christ and by the Spirit, all these things might become true worship, deep and rich. We seek your presence, O God, and we desire above all else to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers in Christ, hear the good news. God does not mock us when we fail to trust, but invites us into a deeper relationship with him. God does not shame us when our faith wavers, but challenges us to be strengthened by his promises. God's purpose is never to tear us down, but always to build us up, forgiven, set free, and made whole. Thanks be to God for his kindness, his generosity, and his love. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Our choir has an anthem for us this morning, The Bells of Easter Ring. reading today is John 21, 1 to 17. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, and Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. 
Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whose Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had taken it off and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went abroad and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, summon John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. So have you ever made a mistake? Okay. Now I don't mean something small or unimportant that can be easily fixed or that you can apologize for. I mean a real, genuine, cold sweat breaks out on your skin, sinking feeling in your stomach, screw up. You don't have to nod this time. Now if you tell me that you haven't, not ever, I won't judge you and I will believe you, I promise. But you may struggle a bit to understand this chapter of the Gospel of John. I have a kind of a, a love-hate or maybe a, a love-confusion relationship with this passage of Scripture. I absolutely love the image of Jesus on shore as dawn breaks and the fishing boats start coming in. It's one of those really sort of immersive moments in scripture, one that you can picture in your mind that stirs your memory and your imagination. The sound of the water running up the beach, the seabirds crying as they head out over the lake, the last of the cool night air dissipating with the sun, the smoky charcoal fire, the sizzling of fish and the smell of warming bread, and Jesus standing and waiting for his disciples to come in from the sea. So peaceful and beautiful and welcoming. But then, after the ecstatic reunion between Jesus and his disciples, especially Peter, the conversation after breakfast takes a turn for the uncomfortable and the painful. Jesus just keeps pushing and pushing, pressing Peter with the same question and command again and again. Do you love me, Peter, and feed my sheep? How must Peter have felt? Okay, the first time, probably. It's a, it's a very Jesus sort of question and command, isn't it? Frustrated or confused, perhaps, by the second repetition. Hurt, the Gospel writer tells us, by the third time, because Jesus 
kept pushing. Did Jesus not believe Peter? Did he think Peter was not getting the meaning of feed my sheep? Either way, Jesus pushes until it hurts. And this is not like Jesus. It's certainly a a sharp and confusing contrast to the feelings evoked by that that peaceful, welcoming, home-from-the-sea image of the dawn breakfast on shore. But in fact, if we step back and think about it, this whole morning, including Peter's very enthusiastic reaction, is a little confusing. This is not the first time that Jesus has visited his disciples since the resurrection. The first time was to Mary in the garden outside his tomb, after some of the other disciples had been and gone already. This is the Easter morning story, the reappearance of Jesus, Mary's friend and teacher, that sent her tearing back to the others in their locked room, the first preacher of the good news of the risen Christ. The second time Jesus came to them was in that locked room, doors and windows all barred shut in fear, and he breathed the Spirit upon them. And then Jesus came a third time just for Thomas, practical, loyal, and not wanting to hope for truth in a lie, Thomas, who couldn't bear to believe without seeing. Jesus' resurrection, his living, breathing self among them once more, this is amazing stuff. Jesus is alive, and that puts basically everything they have ever believed about God, about life and death, in a new light. Surely the disciples and everyone who had followed Jesus should be all fired up now, ready to go forth and risk it all to proclaim what has happened, the good news and the new truth that Jesus has revealed. Not so much, as it turns out. And this is another confusing thing about this story. It is such a perfectly ordinary day. Everything has gone back to normal. The fishers of men have gone back to being fishers of fish. The three years spent with Jesus was, I guess, just a strange interlude, and all that new life, new way of living stuff is a thing of the past. When we find the disciples this morning, they are not seeking Jesus in the present or expecting anything that matters from him in the future. All very unexpected and confusing. In his usual poetic way, John, the gospel writer, shows us the disciples without Jesus, working in the dark and accomplishing nothing. They do not catch a single fish, but when they come to the light, blessings begin to abound. Jesus waits for them on shore, on solid ground, with breakfast sizzling away as morning breaks. Have you ever noticed how often Jesus asks questions that he already knows the answer to, just for our sake? And he does it here again, and he asks them about their catch. Nothing. So he sends them out again. Without Jesus, they are in the dark, and their boat is empty. With him, there is light and abundance and a hot meal, prepared together when the work is done. After the joyous reunion, after the successful catch and the delicious breakfast, things take a different turn between Jesus and Peter. This sounds like a deeply personal conversation, but it happens with an audience. Jesus asks Peter, do you love me more than these? These what? This is a huge point of debate among Bible scholar types who like to debate things. Is Jesus asking, Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Is he asking, Peter, do you love me more than than you love these other people? Or is Jesus asking, do you love me more than all this stuff, your fishing gear, your boat, your ordinary working day? What do you think Jesus meant? So here's what I think by process of elimination. Jesus has, in the past, already had to chew his disciples out for being competitive with one another. So it's probably not, Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples love me? And the second one, about loving Jesus more than Peter loves his friends, I mean, that seems obvious to me, right? They all love and adore Jesus enough to have left behind their families and their homes and followed him around for three years, sticking with him through thick and thin for the most part. So I think all things considered, Peter, do you love me more than your ordinary life, more than this comfort zone of being a fisherman that you have returned to? 
I think that is our best guess for what Jesus was asking. And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus responded, feed my lambs. But two more times, for a total of three, Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. And two more times, for a total of three, Peter expresses his love for Jesus. Now, we know that Peter was a very emotional man. Each time he takes a blow to the heart when Jesus questions his love. Jesus pushes Peter until it hurts, until Jesus' question is painful for Peter to hear and to answer. Why? Why does Jesus expose Peter in front of his friends in such an ungentle and intrusive way? Just to commission his disciples with the mission task of feeding his flock? Why then speak only to Peter? Why not question them all? The Jesus we come to know through the Gospel of John is a Jesus of great subtlety and symbolism, of poetry and metaphor. And there is a, a subtle clue for us in this text that once uncovered sheds a whole new light on this lovely and confusing morning. Now, I lived for a couple of years in England, in the Southwest, and people in cities in England don't usually have backyards in quite the same way that we do. So parks and public spaces are very heavily used there as sort of a, a neighborhood backyard. Now, every warm, sunny weekend, Victoria Square, the big park near where I lived, would be taken over by picnickers, each group with their own small, disposable charcoal briquette grill that you could buy at the grocery store. Now, I had to sort of run the gauntlet every Sunday morning as I walked home from church. Lunch could not come soon enough after walking through a dozen or more barbecue picnics. The haze of charcoal smoke sort of lingered over the whole park, and the smell of sausages and burgers and sometimes even fish eye-watering and mouth-watering and unforgettable. Now Jesus' charcoal fire, I imagine, was just as smoky, and I wonder if it stirred Peter's memory of another charcoal fire he'd seen just recently. On the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter and John followed after him as he was taken away. John went in to speak to the high priest, but Peter stayed in the courtyard. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were all standing around it and sort of warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself and he stood over that charcoal fire and warmed his hands and denied knowing Jesus at all every time someone asked him for a total of three times. This is not an accident. A charcoal fire appears only in these two places in all of Scripture. And the charcoal fire is our clue, John's hint, to help us understand what we're reading. A charcoal fire, the, the site of Peter's greatest failure, is now recreated by the risen Christ as the site of his redemption. When Peter swims ashore from the, the minor failure of not catching any fish that night, Jesus is there up ahead, waiting with freshly cooked fish to enact the, the minor redemption of breakfast. You might be thinking at this point that when Jesus asks Peter again and again, three times, if Peter loves him, you might be thinking that Jesus is trying to make Peter feel hurt because he hurt Jesus by denying that he knew him. Some kind of, of payment or retribution for Peter's failures, like a, a spiritual pressing on Peter's bruises. But that is not what is happening here. When Jesus pushes Peter with his repeated question, it's not for the purpose of making Peter hurt. The why of it is that Jesus is moving Peter into a, a space of vulnerability that is necessary to break Peter open and free him from what he's done. What looks so painful and intrusive turns out to be restorative and freeing. And that does sound like Jesus, doesn't it? A God who forgives and sets free and makes whole. Now, Peter learns a couple of things through this process, things that we can learn too. First, Jesus knows each of us personally and intimately, and he meets us in our need. 
Jesus knows what is burdening Peter's heart, what has sent him back to fishing for fish instead of fishing for people. Peter denied Jesus three times, so Jesus lets Peter express his love to him three times. And if Peter had denied him a thousand times, I think Jesus would have stood on that beach and reminded him a thousand times that Peter's truest self, our truest self, is the self that loves and follows Jesus. That's the first thing we can learn. The second is that Jesus always challenges Peter to show his love through service, through generosity and welcome and kindness and love, through good deeds. Christians are to feed Christ's flock. But Jesus knows that he can't send Peter out to serve unless Peter understands that he is fully forgiven, loved without condition, released from the crushing burden of guilt and shame. The task, like the repeated question, is not some sort of punishment or penance for Peter. It's how Peter is going to express his love for Christ, how Peter will know himself to be free, and how he will be healed and made whole. We don't usually think of serving others in Jesus' name as a big part of how the healing, the, the making whole of being saved, actually works. But it is. We serve and we grow, and through that we are made whole. Peter's story becomes our story as he moves beyond his past failure and present imperfection and into the hopeful, confident future story that God has intended for us all along. Healing and abundant life were never meant to be held in secret trust or something you only experience once. When we are reconciled to Jesus, brought back to him, we serve, we feed Jesus as lambs. Jesus doesn't say, make them follow a specific set of rules or sign off on this statement of doctrine or use this hymn book or worship in this way. Jesus says, feed them, welcome them, be generous and be kind to them and love them as I do. As simple as a shore breakfast of fried bread and fish and as complex and powerful as a charcoal fire lit twice for a hurting soul. But Peter was Peter every moment of his life. And within minutes, just past what we read together today, his essential Peterness gets him in trouble once again. Now, seeing the disciple John, who Peter seems to be especially competitive with, Peter asks, Lord, what about this guy? Kind of a, you're going to give John a job too, right? I'm not feeding all these sheep on my own. I'm paraphrasing here, but Jesus basically tells Peter not to stick his nose into other people's ministries. Jesus gave Peter a job and equipped him with forgiveness and freedom and a path to healing so that Peter could do his job. So what if John or Thomas or the church down the road has a different strength or ministry? What's that to us? We follow Jesus and we do the work that Jesus puts before us. And the beauty of signing on with Jesus, among other things, is that we don't lose ourselves. Peter did not lose his essential Peterness. He will continue to go on and cause trouble throughout the book of Acts. I have not lost my essential Emilyness, and I bet the same is true for you. Sign on with Jesus, and you get to be you, but more, the you that God created you to be. You get to learn that, like Peter did, that nothing you've done or had happened to you makes your life or your future unsavable. Peter repeatedly denied Jesus, alienated himself, rejected love, loyalty, faith, friendship, and hope, and was complicit in the death of his innocent friend and teacher. And Jesus so loved Peter that he pushed him to a place where he was vulnerable enough to be forgiven and to forgive himself, to be set free and set on a new path. And this is why I asked if you'd ever screwed up really, really badly in a way that couldn't easily be apologized for, in a way that required redeeming. You and I have all said and done some things we wish we hadn't. We've all experienced or, or seen some things that we wish could be undone. And you and I fully believe in the cross and in salvation, and Christ is risen indeed on Easter morning, but we still cry and it still hurts when we experience our own personal Good Fridays after Easter Sunday. 
We fall back into our old patterns, too, after the hallelujahs are over for another year, trying to return to our ordinary days, our familiar ways, to get back to normal. But always Jesus comes and looks into our eyes and into our hearts, asking us questions that seem obvious or painful or even offensive at first, pressing on our bruises, pushing us to answer. And it turns out the answers to those questions are the only answers that really matter. Again and again, Jesus will bring us to the sites of our failures, and then he will act as often as we need him to, to recreate those moments of failure into moments of redemption, opportunities for his grace, wellsprings of that new, risen, abundant life, forgiven and set free. It's, it's the Easter message, folded down and made small and personal to fit within a single human life. What is dead and broken in us, our sharp edges, our deep hurts, are recreated and made new and life-giving by that same immense power that raised Christ from his tomb. Thanks be to God. Amen. For our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession this morning, the response is on the screen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of all creation, you have given us so much, and we are truly blessed. We thank you for your constant guidance throughout our lives, for your wisdom in all things, for the way your word encourages, inspires, and sustains us in our daily spiritual lives. You, Lord, speak to us in the seasons, the landscape, and the weather. You speak to us in the stories of old and the word of your prophets and apostles. You speak to us in your church and in its ministries of today. O oh God, you are our rock and our refuge in times of trouble, and for this we give you thanks. When the storms of life come, we are assured that we can lean on and trust in you until the very end. For your presence, your gifts, and your blessings, we thank you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign and wise God, we pray for those who lead. Help our politicians and their advisors make wise and fair decisions that will uphold the well-being of all and nurture our nation's prosperity. Guide leaders in all sectors and in every kind of organization, large and small. May they lead justly and equitably, balancing the demands of their work with the value and dignity of those they employ. Lord, in your mercy, Living and eternal God, we pray for your church, for the Presbyterian Church in Canada, for the congregations of our presbytery, for all Christ-centered churches in Sarnia, for our own St. Andrew's community, our staff, lay leaders, and volunteers, and all those who worship here together today. We pray for unity of faith and purpose among Christians everywhere, unity that enfolds diversity without seeking to erase it, that seeks to live out your vision for your people, one body held together in Christ, bound by your love for us and our love for you. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, in our broken world, so many are suffering and hurting. You sent your Son to heal and make whole, and so we pray for those whose lives are ruled by hate and vengeance rather than love and justice for those whose homes are not places of love or safety, but of fear and violence, for those who have no home and have become invisible on our streets, for those who are treated badly because of status, unwellness, ethnicity, or religion. Lord, you asked us to love our neighbors, all of them, not just the ones we choose. Help us to carry out your command and make a positive difference in the lives of our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate and caring God, we pray for all those in our congregation and communities who are ill at home or in hospital, for all who are anxiously awaiting treatment, results, or appointments, for worried relatives and carers who are exhausted and bearing heavy burdens. In this moment of silent prayer, Lord, we speak in our hearts the names and situations we are worried about today.
Lord, equip us and guide us to assist those for whom we've prayed in their time of need. Pour out your own healing power upon them, that they may know your loving and peaceful presence in every moment. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful and loving Father, we pray that your grace would always go before us and follow after us, guiding us continually in the way of peace, leading us to serve you through good works that are inspired by our faith and by your saving intention for humanity and all creation. We entrust to you all the concerns and worries of this world, of our community, our church, and our lives, full of hope and steadied by our faith in your goodness and love. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, we pray together now as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is The Day of Resurrection, number 249 in your hymn book. join me in our words of sending on the screen. It is not enough to claim that Jesus Christ is our Lord. Our mission must be his. To make his kingdom a reality for those around us by word and action. The way to do this is to live as he lived. Brothers in service and love. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit be upon you and all those whom you love, today and always. Amen. Amen.